Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Sen Gupta and IIT Indore for having me here. Uh, it's a pleasure and privilege. And Indore is a pretty familiar city for me because this is my like 15th visit in the last, I think, four or five years. Uh, and I think the fifth time at IIT Indore. So I feel Indore is like a second home for me. And I've always enjoyed uh, coming here. Uh, Sarafa, Chap Chapandukan, Omkareshwar, Khajrana, and five times I've visited Mahakal, uh, including Basmarti. So uh, I feel fortunate in that regard. And so again, thank you all uh, for having me here and thank you for joining the session. Uh, so the chapter is, uh, the, the IEEE uh, focus here is consumer electronics. Uh, what I'd like to talk about is uh, user-centered design. And I feel that, uh, at least in my experience, even at Microsoft and other companies, we have seen that user-centered design uh, has played an important role in the success of the products that you develop. And products in the consumer space, especially from Apple, if you see uh, iMac, iPod, and iPhone have been huge success. Uh, and one of the key reasons has been that design has been the key cornerstone uh, when Apple made these products. And actually, the success of these products was measured in the jump in the share price. So when I, Apple released iMac, the share price before iMac and after iMac, there's a world of difference. And it was applied successively to other products, iPod, iPhone. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, design. But before that, uh, just to get a sense of the audience, how many are uh, faculty members here? OK, and how many students? OK, and anyone from the industry? OK. And how many of you are familiar with user-centered design? OK, so only a few. So this is one of the things, uh, even at Microsoft, uh, we have uh, seen it being applied. Uh, and this is our, our actually a lot of learnings have come from the success of uh, Apple uh, products. Uh, and therefore, the products that Microsoft is designing, they are not just engineering driven anymore. So there's a huge focus on design and especially keeping the user, the consumer, uh, the customer in mind and how easy or difficult it is to use. And especially in today's uh, digital age, uh, it's very easy for a consumer or user to switch to a competitive, competing product or a competing offering because it, you know within within seconds you can uh, choose to decide that. So I share some learnings that we have had from this, and hopefully there are some takeaways for all of you uh, from this, and you can think about in your area how you can apply some of these uh, techniques. So it's about building the right thing, not just building it right. I think that's the key message I'd like to uh, leave. Um, and so what I, I'm going to cover is, you know, how to define the business value. Uh, you know, how, how can you define a business value of why user-centered design, right? What is a business benefit? Like I shared the example of iMac, right? Uh, when Steve Jobs was hired back into Apple, right? Uh, so he was initially fired, the, the founder of the company, right? Apple wasn't doing well, he was fired, he went and he started a new company, Next Computer. That didn't do well, right? But he had an amazing uh, operating system that he had developed as part of that venture. And in the process, Apple itself was struggling and so they didn't know what to do, and they decided to bring Steve Jobs back, and they bought Next Computer. So with that deal, they got two things. One is the Next operating system, and two is Mr. Steve Jobs back. Once he was back with the company on the second day of his job, 
back at Apple, he met with the analysts, media, and he talked about how he is going to reinvent Apple. And the key message that he mentioned in that uh, meeting with the, uh, you know, the analysts and the media and the shareholders was that he's going to make design the key center, the key focus of Apple. Right? And that percolated throughout the company. And the very first product that he got out was iMac. I'll talk uh, some of the learnings from that. And then, and it, so here, there are two learnings here. One is it was a top-down approach, coming directly from the CEO and the management team. That was the key message sent across the uh, company that design is going to be the key focus. It's all going to be design driven, not engineering driven. And when we say design, it is primarily user centered design, keeping the user in mind. So whoever is going to use iMac, he or she should feel comfortable, joyful, ex uh, you know, uh, enjoying the experience, it's not just get using a computer. You're using the computer to just the, get the task done, but you should feel happy. You should feel productive at the end of the day. When whatever device or gadget or consumer electronics item you use, you should feel that you have accomplished successfully with little training, and you would like to go back and use that device again. Right? So that's user-centered design. Once iMac was released, you can go back and look at the stock chart. The stock price of Apple jumped multiple times. And the learnings from iMac were applied to successive products. The next one was iPod. And I, if you look at the history of iPod, it went through four iterations. It was the fourth iteration which was highly successful. Anyone watch the movie Steve Jobs? It was that. So there is a scene in that movie where he's speaking with his daughter. It's on the, I think, the terrace of a building or Lisa, Lisa. Lisa uh, terrace or balcony of a, uh, the building. And when and they are having an argument. Okay, uh, father daughter, they are having an argument. They are debating. They are not happy. While they are having that argument, Lisa is having the Sony Walkman. She has a Sony Walkman tucked in, uh, uh, you know, waist, um, and she has the headphones. And while they're having the argument, Steve Jobs uh, mentions a point, which is, he says, you know what, one day I'm going to make it easy for you to listen to music. He says, one day I'm going to put the thousand songs in your pocket. Thousand songs in your pocket. So you won't have to carry that uh, bulky. Mm -hmm. Sony Walkman, and you'll have thousands of songs in your pocket, and it will be easy for you to. Now, this is this is keen observation. So, first of all, Sony Walkman was hugely, hugely successful. Despite its success, the it no, not many, or it wasn't. There were not many complaints heard about that it is bulky. Okay. So even Sony did not come up with a lighter version, if you look at the history of it. Now this is Steve Jobs, he's just observing, she's struggling or fiddling with the Sony Walkman and he's just saying, I'm just going to make it easy. They're having an argument, a heated argument, and in that argument he's making a keen observation and he says, I'll make it easy for you to listen to music. And you'll be carrying thousands of songs in your pocket. That was the idea that he got. Now here, if you see, this was idea coming from the inventor of the product, not from the consumer of the product. So if you read about Steve Jobs, he says that even the user does not know what they want. Many times that's what happens. So when we say user-centered design, it's not about just going to the user and say, hey, do you like it? What would you like next? It's not about that. It's a combination of things. It's observation, it's interviewing, it's asking questions, it's clarifications, and then figuring out, and then of course you need engineering input. Is it feasible, is it doable? 
right? And what's the business value of it? How much will it cost? How much will it take to get it to the market? How are you going to mark, you know, all of that. So user-centered design doesn't mean that you just go and ask the user saying, hey, what would you like? Do you like this? Do you not like this? How do you rate it? It's not just about that. That's just one perspective. And that may or may not be the definitive perspective. Right? So this was the observation and that triggered the idea of iPod. That was the next product and it was in the fourth iteration iPod was hugely successful. So it went through the first, second, third. So it was a continuous uh, it was a continuous cycle, right? Uh, and then iPod was a huge success. And then again, if you look at the share price of Apple, skyrocketed. And then iPhone, uh, you know, that was another huge uh, success. And if you look at the history of iPhone, it's really remarkable. Anyone read the book uh, Blue Ocean Strategy? So iPhone is a very good example of Blue Ocean Strategy in my mind. Uh, blue ocean is where, uh, so a red ocean is where there's a bloodbath. You have just too many competitors. So if you look at the smartphone industry, it's a bloodbath. Uh, many smartphones available in the market at much uh, lower cost. But iPhone was blue ocean. When iPhone was introduced, it was one of the most expensive smartphones. And who would think that people would want to pay that kind of money for a smartphone when there are so cheap, cheaper phones uh, available? But when iPhone was introduced, there was hardly any competition in that, in that market, the blue ocean market. And so uh, lastly, I'll talk about, uh, you know, how to measure the user experience, some guidelines around it. Uh, so I'll cover quickly about methodologies and tools, and then how, how do you measure user experience? What are the different techniques you can use? So anyone see any issue with this design? There's a big gap between the... Yeah. And so what is the uh, outcome of that, or what could be the outcome of that? If a leg, leg gets stuck in that space, you lose a leg. Yeah. That is what happened in Indoor conversation. Oh, okay. So you can see that, uh, you know, uh, whenever this was done, right, the design of the, the compartments of the train and the design of the station were kind of done independently, right, without keeping the user in mind, whether it will work or not work for the user, right? So there has to be a coordination and a communication between the two departments, and not only that, you need to test it out. You just can't roll it out saying, okay, this is, you know, these are the compartments, this is how the train is, and they are, go do their job, and then uh, the train station is built, and then all of a sudden you see that there's a, there's a gap, and that is causing a lot of accidents. And I think there is an initiative now, I, I read somewhere in the newspaper, to bring, you know, to uh, fix this particular issue. So. You, you know, this is a good example of where, you know, the user was not in, you know, not at all in the picture. And the design of the train and the design of the station was sort of done independently. And then when they came together, although it works, but it doesn't work as seamlessly as we would like to have. And here we are talking about real human beings, uh, the danger of an accident, and, you know, whatever happens after that. So there are serious issues involved in this. And therefore, it's very important to keep the user in mind when you're trying to design. I already talked about uh, iMac. Uh, it was a huge, stupendous success story. And uh, as far as I have read, I think this was one of the key things uh, that made a technology company like Apple come to the forefront primarily because of its focus on design. And when IMAC was designed, it was all departments working in tandem, in, in, in together. So the marketing and sales department were aware of what the engineering and design team is trying to do. So that they can pitch, they can market IMAC based on what is it, 
that makes iMac different from the rest of the uh, computers that are available. So, um, like I said, you know, the, the team that is designing the train and the compartments and the team that is designing the station, they can't necessarily work in isolation. They need to be communicating and they need to be testing it with users. And that is one of the things Apple did it very successfully with iMac and all its uh, products. Now, to share a Microsoft example, mm -hmm. and I'll be honest, and this we talk about it within Microsoft itself. Microsoft has not been traditionally a design-focused company. It has been traditionally an engineering-focused company. It is, you know, uh, so we have a we have a plan of whatever product or application we are developing. We get the requirements. We think we got the requirements, and we straight away go to coding, right? Now, between requirements and engineering, we feel that, oh, and how do we get the requirements? What happens in Microsoft? We say, oh, how do you like that application? And we'll meet with 10, 15, 20 users and say, oh, you know, we love it. Or somebody says, we don't like it. Now, we actually don't know. Now, he may be saying love it because he doesn't want to offend us, because we are the creators of the app. He doesn't want to disrespect us. He wants to work with us. He knows that he needs this app to get his job done so that he can get continued support. So there may be various reasons why a particular user uh, may be saying whether he or she likes it or doesn't like it. And this was over Skype or over a phone call. There have been some many instances where we have developed an app or a product and we have gone to the user's location wherever they are using and we have actually seen the user getting frustrated but not talking about it. So there's a lot of through just plain observation. So a lot of times, if you just ask the user, the user will either say good things, maybe the, it is right, maybe the app is working, but a lot of times it is not. Right? Uh, that may not be the case. So it's very important to understand how it is working for the users and you know uh, what are the common themes coming across. So user-centered design, uh, there are two aspects to it. You know, it should be research driven. There's a lot of focus and emphasis on research and there are many research techniques that can be used. So it is all about understanding the user and that's your opportunity also to drive innovation. So the example I shared about Steve Jobs talking with his daughter and he's just observing that she is struggling, uh, you know, a little bit with the Walkman and she says that one day I'm just going to make it easy for you to listen to music and you'll have thousands of songs in your pocket. This is not something his daughter asked him, this is not something any other Walkman user uh, talked about it and you can see the, the stupendous success of iPod, it actually completely wiped out the Sony Walkman. Uh, so again, iPod is an, a good example of uh, blue ocean strategy. User-centered design was the thought process that Steve Jobs had, except that it didn't come from the user, it came from his own mind, his own experiences. And then usability, it's very important whatever you put out, that you do usability testing. Unless you test it, you will not know. How is it working for the user? And you have to do that before you actually uh, release any product out in the market, right? Uh, and there's, there will be a lot of feedback, there are a lot of learnings you will get through the usability testing that you'll have to then drive back into your design and engineering. And that's how you will be able to get a continuous improvement. Uh, and that these together will help you build the right thing, not just building it right.
So in Microsoft, we are, a lot of us are like engineers. So we are very passionate about the code that we write, the algorithms. Oh, this algorithm is super, you know, right? it's much faster than the one that was there before. Great, nothing wrong with that and that's a great achievement. But when it all packaged together, is it working for the user? If it's not, you may have a very technically superior product, but it probably doesn't have enough business value. And if you're not able to translate that in business value, then uh, it may not be as good uh, in the market, right? So, so a couple of definitions, uh, you know, sometimes it can get confusing. What is usability and what is user-centered design? User-centered design is the process, it's the methodology. And usability is one way to measure, right? It is the experience. It is the experience of using that particular product. We have developed many products and the user is struggling. We have seen it. They need a lot of help. They need a lot of training. But when people buy iPhone, they don't go to any training workshops. Apple doesn't come to your home and say, this is how you use iPhone. People are able to figure it out on their own. Within a couple of hours, their iPhone is up and running and they are very happy. That is, user, that is one measure of usability, is that it is working for, and this is whether it's a, a professional, whether it's a student, a homemaker, doesn't matter who the user is, whether, uh, you know, a uh, retired professional, young, executive, it doesn't matter, or a kid. Anyone and everyone is able to figure out how to use iPhone on their own. Maybe they'll ask their family members or somebody who has already used it, hey, how do I do this? That's it. Right? But they don't need any, they don't go to any trainings. They don't go to any workshops. Nor does the app from the store that you bought. They don't send a representative to your home to say, okay, I'm going to now help you set up iPhone. You do it yourself. That is the ease of use. That is how easy iPhone is. You don't need, so one measure of usability is how much training is required to get the software up and running or get the product up and running. The minimal the training, if the user is able to figure it out on their own, it works great. I think you have a very usable product. Uh, design innovation process, uh, you know, it's not just so, you know, I, I'll be honest, Microsoft has been traditionally very focused on the technology aspect. Engineering, coding, is it faster? And if you look at the history of Microsoft, there are many products which have not done well. And one of the reasons has been that it has not worked well for the users. The other reason could be the business dynamics of it, but we have you know, many examples of where the product has not worked well for the user. The user have said, you know, it's just too kind, time consuming, or just too much, too many things to set up, right? And so in that sense, Microsoft is learning, right? And uh, it's trying to continuously evolve itself and uh, trying to continuously improve itself. And that's a very important aspect of user-centered design. Then the business and the you know usability and desirability. So all these three have to come together. And Apple did an amazing job of bringing all these three together. And that is why you have seen it's not just iMac. It's a series of products of Apple have been hugely successful, one after another. It's very difficult to be able to repeat that kind of success product after product. A business value uh, of great experience, you know, it helps improve productivity, improves usage, drives user satisfaction. Uh, business, you know, there's a return on investment that you can calculate. A customer partner experience, it helps build a brand. So Apple actually turned itself into a brand of iProducts. 
And so people are very, have been very curious, what's the next, when's the next version of iPod coming, when's the next version of iPhone, people are looking forward to it, right? That, that is the kind of brand uh, it established uh, itself. A reduced cost, you know, by reducing the amount of training required, amount of support required, uh, development cost, rework. A lot of the app learnings from iMac were applied to iPod and then to iPhone. So a lot of rework was avoided because those design learnings were, uh, you know, transferable from one product to the next. Of course, with modifications because the products are different. Uh, the customer partner employee experience, you know, hugely improves. So this is what I was talking about, the traditional versus design-driven product development. Uh, I, you know, I think it's pretty simple and straightforward. I think it's common sense. But many times we have seen that I worked at Bank of America prior to Microsoft. Again, it was like plan requirements built. We deploy. Our users start using it. Our users are frustrated. They're not happy with it. So yeah, it works, but you know, it just takes too long. Right? And we are wondering like, okay, we did, like we spent hours for six months, nine months developing this and you're saying it's okay, yeah, it works, it just gets the job done. We would love to hear like, you are loving it, you are excited about it. That is not the case. So there is an element of design that needs to be introduced. And this is, I mean, this is not rocket science. This is, I, I think, uh, you know, manufacturing industry, uh, uh, sorry, the uh, aircraft industry, uh, the construction industry, they have already been doing it, right? They don't build the buildings directly. They first build a model of it. They build a design of it. And then that gets through multiple iterations and approval process. And only once you have a model is then you start constructing the building. So it's the same principle to be applied in software development. Um, so the user experience uh, process, the key aspect is that you would ideally want to fail, fail fast. You want to rule out the options which are not working, right? Because then it will get you closer to the one that is hopefully going to work. So there are going to be many different iterations. You know, if you're building a user interface, you can build a user interface in many different ways, right? But uh, depending on who your target customer base is, you need to figure out which one will work the best for most of your users. Have you heard of the word, uh, the company Intuit? And they are one of the uh, hugely successful companies of personal finance software. Uh, have you heard the software Quicken? Quicken is developed by Intuit. So Quicken is one of the hugely successful personal finance management software. So if you want to manage your expenses and income and track them, uh, I think Quicken has more than 95% share of the personal finance management software. In fact, Microsoft tried to compete with Quicken. They came up with a product called Microsoft Money. They just couldn't beat Quicken. One of the things Quicken did was, when once it reached a certain stage of number of users, Quicken is a personal fi finance management software, which means you would typically use it at your home or in your personal space, not necessarily in an office space. So they actually sent their user researchers with the approval of the users to go to their home. And what did they do? If I'm using Quicken here, they're standing right behind me. And they're just observing me how I'm using the software. They're not even interacting with me, 
nothing so they are saying okay what am i what am i whatever i am going to do i am going to enter expense or i am going to generate a report they are just observing that and they are taking notes this is what they did with many thousand users and then of course they interviewed also and then the summary of all these findings is what fed back into the design of quicken quicken is another great example of user centered design one of the key reasons quicken is hugely successful is because it is it is a breeze to enter my finances and generate reports it like i'm not even thinking that i'm using a software it's just like i'm just going getting a task done done i don't want to spend hours and hours just entering data and hours and hours generating report i just want to get the job done i want to get my income expense report i want to see where i stand in terms of my financial health and i'm i'm done so it's not about quicken or intuit it's about my task i just want to get this done and move on to the other and quicken did an amazing job of helping the users improve their productivity when you are working on your personal uh, finances so in this saying the key aspect that i want to highlight is that if you're starting with a new idea then you would do a lot of brainstorming so you would have a lot of ideas the ad hoc user study you see there are three or four lines that ad hoc user study formal usability study so when i do a lot of brainstorming the ad hoc user study is basically i'm going to the to the user i'm going to show these are my ideas what do you think some will say yeah this is good some will say no i don't think some will say i don't understand which is fine you got some input now you take that input and you move to the storyboard and wireframe and i'll talk more about the storyboard and wireframe in a little bit then you again go back to the user you say okay you told me this now i have done i have extrapolated further and i'm going to show you what i think would work for you so you will walk the user through okay this is what i have think what do you think or i may come up with a set of screens and i'll ask the user hey just show me how you will use the screen and i'll just observe quicken is another software that i tell you you require very little or no training to use that software So this is how, and then I get to a detailed design. So I do iterative ad hoc user study. I need to keep the user in mind. I should not forget the user. I'm not designing this software for myself. I'm designing it for the user. And it's not about like they need to uh, promote my software. It's not about they need to market my software. They need to feel good that I'm I'm able to get my job done with the software. If they feel good about it, they'll automatically promote my software. so the key aspect is that if i fail i want to fail in this phase i don't want to fail once my code is out software is out there i want minimal failures so this is the the design phase and you know you want to build the confidence by actually failing faster and failing multiple times in this cycle you don't want to fail once the product is out so you create choices you have multiple options and then from that you narrow down based on user feedback user input business value proposition technology feasibility a user may say i want something very very fancy something very you know uh user may say i want like 10 years back if user say i want uh not i don't want skype meeting i want virtual reality i want the person to maybe 10 years back it wasn't feasible but today i think we are hearing virtual reality and augmented reality so whatever the user wants or desires not necessarily that it is technically feasible so if it is not technically feasible you may not be able to uh, implement that so that is another important aspect uh, to keep in mind so i'll quickly move through the speed prototyping options the first and foremost we actually look at microsoft is do we really need if there is an existing app do you really need to create anything new 
So if it ain't broken, then don't fix it. So we actually put a lot of diligence on this. Just because a few users are frustrated with an app doesn't mean that now you go and make a business case for a new app. You may want to either fix those issues, address them in whatever best possible way, and just retain that. So you can save a lot of money and time and effort. Uh, and then again, is it a, you know, a core app? Is it very important app? Or is it a sunset app? Is this app going to get, re product going to get retired or replaced in a few years? You probably don't want to invest as much in that product. You may want to do it in some other product. So don't create anything new. The three columns that are cost, fidelity, and level of interaction. So that is the most simplest one. Don't create anything new, you know, there's no cost involved. Uh, not much to do there, but it is actually one of very important option that we have seen does not get discussed at all. The tendency is usually saying, "Oh, this is not working. This is not you're not happy." Okay, just keep using this for the next few months, and then we'll have a new one out. And then we have a new set of problems with the new one. So. You know, it's just like because it is so busy and uh, you know everyone is busy, so the natural inclination is saying, okay, if it's not, you're not happy with this, we'll nix that and we'll create something new. So we actually discuss a lot of times, don't create anything new. The second one is sketches. So when you have ideas for a new product, we do a lot of sketching. And we have, even though we have engineering background, we are trying to become designers and artists and all. But sketching is the most simplest one. You can brainstorm ideas. You can just take a paper napkin or a paper and pencil or pen and just sketch. Hey, what do you think of this idea? And that is one of the ways to get early input. Then you can actually do paper prototype. I mean, it's a more uh, you know sophisticated way of sketching. So you can actually spend time doing really nice design and all that. Storyboard is a combination of sketches. So if I want to show how a particular uh, task is going to get done, I'm going to enter data, I'm going to review data, and I'm going to generate a report. How do I demonstrate that to the user? I can't do it with just one sketch. I have to show multiple sketches. So I have to show a story. right? So that's the storyboard or wireframes. UI mockups, this is where software tools start coming in. So instead of paper and pencil, now you will use some software to do the UI mockups. But you can see the difference that you don't need, if you can do sketching and discuss ideas, you don't need any software. You can wait. A lot of the ideas can be discussed and debate just over sketches. And that's the, the lowest cost. You don't need any preparation time because you can find paper and pencil anywhere and you can discuss and trade ideas and if you don't like a particular sketch you can throw it out and you can replace it much much easily. With software you know you have to install the software, you have to know how to use the software and if something doesn't work then you have to create another version that takes a lot of time. So you can see the fidelity also increases as you move from paper to software and all. You're going from low fidelity to high fidelity. Partial code, so if you, you, you can use PowerPoint to design screens, right? Now if you start adding code behind that, that takes a lot more effort. Quick code, video demo. Video demo is a great way to get feedback from remote users global users, you can't travel all the time, right? Uh, or you may not be able to schedule a meeting. So you can just record the, uh, a video and send it to the, your users and they can watch the video and give you feedback of how that particular design is working for them or what do they think about it. And quality code prototype is basically the most sophisticated, which means you're actually building the product, almost. So if you're going to make that decision, it better be that you're clear on what you're going to build. Because if you're going to spend six to nine months spend, uh, doing a quality code prototype, you don't want that effort to go in waste. You want to continue building on that. So these are all the different speed prototyping options and depending on what you're building, where you're building, what stage you are in, 
you know, you can decide which one to use. And I've done a lot of workshops at uh, user centered design workshops at academia institutes across India, and including institutes here in Indore. Uh, these are user centered design workshops for engineering students because engineering, uh, unfortunately, they don't have a subject on design. And the one, I've never used any software in those workshops. It's just paper and pencil for the students. So no setup time and paper and pencil, everyone can relate. And a lot of students actually realize that they're good at art, <laughs> they're good artists, they're able to <laughs> draw well, or some are able to improve their drawing capabilities. But there was a lot of interaction happening between the students when they were doing it on paper and pencil. There are some examples of sketches. Uh, sketch is the most quick, uh, you know, timely, inexpensive. It's a disposable, you can sketch. If it, it doesn't work, you don't like it, you can throw it away. Uh, you know, minimal detail. There is going to be ambiguity. And the reason you are sketching is not to confirm. It's actually to explore. You're not saying, oh, this is a sketch, you know, what do you think? Oh, you like it, so okay, it's confirmed. No. When I show it to you, I'm actually inviting ideas, positive and negative, right? Because this is the best time to debate and discuss because it is the least expensive and the least effort. Uh, because if the sketch doesn't work, I can just throw the paper out and create a new one much, much easily. And I can do this for software, I can do this for uh, consumer electronics, I can do this for if I'm building a house, and we're building, trying to build a car, you know, sketching works. Paper prototype, a little bit more sophisticated uh, of way of sketching. Storyboard, it's a sequence of sketches. So I'm, I'm telling a story of how a particular task will get completed. UI mockups, now I get into the software area. So I may use PowerPoint to build a UI mockup. Uh, partial code prototype. So there may be code behind the UI mockups. So if I click on a button, when I, when I create a UI, I add a button. If I click on a button, it does something. So that is partial code. Uh, quick code, uh, you know, I add more code. Quality code, it gets more sophisticated. So now it is more looking more like, maybe like the final product. Video demo, uh, remote participants, if I can't, you know, uh, work with them on sketching, I can maybe create sketches and create a video around it and then send that video. Especially if I have thousands and thousands of users spread across globally. So video demo may also work in that regard. What are the tools I can use for speed prototyping? Uh, I want to quickly talk about that. Sketches is very simple. White paper, pen, pencil, whiteboard, markers. Paper prototype, white paper and markers, storyboard. For storyboard, uh, you can use PowerPoint. There is a add-in called storyboarding add-in. It's free. You can go on the net and search for storyboarding add-in for PowerPoint. Once you download and install that, uh, PowerPoint, you'll get all the uh, tools to create a UI mockup. So like if you need a button, scroll bar, field, the storyboarding add-in adds, adds those uh, you know, UI uh, controls. So then it becomes very easy for you to just drag and drop those controls and create your screen, right? Uh, there are others uh, like Sketchflow, Balsamic, Flare Builder. Uh, many of them have like a free version limited uh, features and then uh, uh, paid version, which is a full feature. UI mockups, Photoshop, you know, one of the very sophisticated tools. But the learning curve for Photoshop is very steep. Whereas for PowerPoint is not that steep. Most of us have used PowerPoint and know how to use PowerPoint. So it's much easier. Partial code prototype, sketch flow, expression web, uh, you know, video demo, um, you can do recordings. Tools analyze, so like, you know, PowerPoint, Visio, this is just a sampling. So, you know, PowerPoint is a super easy, learning curve is very low cost. 
if, if you have Office, PowerPoint is included, ease of collaboration, and what you can use for. So, you know, similarly, Visio, Sketchflow, Photoshop is very expensive uh, to buy the license, right? So on and so forth. So, so uh, the last part is how to measure user experience. Um, and Google has actually published a framework, and you can Google it. <laughs> uh, you'll find all the details. Uh, it's called the Heart Framework. So happiness, engagement, adoption, retention, task success, these are some of the criteria defined in the Heart Framework. Now, you're not limited just to this. You can define your own. You can add or subtract to this framework. Uh, maybe some of these are not applicable in the case of the product that you are developing. Uh, there may be a different set. Now, for example, like uh, engagement within Microsoft, we have many applications. There is an expense uh, application. So if I'm traveling and I want to get reimbursed on my expenses, I will use that. Every employee will use so the engagement is going to be 100% because I don't have a choice. I don't have an option, right? I may not be happy with it, so the happiness may be low, but the engagement is going to be 100% because everyone is looking to get their expenses reimbursed. So I may not measure engagement because if I try to measure that, it is always going to be 100%. So engagement in this particular criteria may not be a good measure of whether the application is working or not. But happiness could be that I'm not happy or I'm happy with the application, whatever the case is. Adoption, again, may not be a relevant case in this because everyone is using it. So, uh, you know, uh, retention may not be. But task success could be for am I able to submit my expense report quickly and easily. So, and then they have the goals, signals, and metrics uh, process. So let's say if you are publishing uh, YouTube videos, right? how are you going to measure the success of that? So what is your goal? Why are you publishing YouTube videos? What is the signal? And then the metrics around it. Right, so the signal is, if anyone is searching on Google, is my YouTube link coming up? If it is not coming up in the top uh, five or 10, that first page, then that's not a good signal. Now let's say if it is coming up, what's a metric you can use? So if it is coming up, say the, the let's say it is the second one in the, the uh, the page. Uh, it gives you a header, right? About the YouTube, what that is. But let's say the user did not click on it, did not actually go to the YouTube. So the metric could be saying that, you know, the header is not informative or exciting enough for the user to actually go to the YouTube. Right? So these are some, de and depending on what you're designing, whether it's a consumer electronic, whether it's a website, whether it's an internal corporate application or a consumer product, you may have different goals, signals, and metrics, and you will have a, a way of measuring the heart framework, right? So it's very important to define these because only then you will know whether your product is being used or not, and are the users happy or not. So what is the key aspect in iMac? Mm -hmm. Anyone? Which made it successful? What did Steve Jobs focus on for iMac? User experience. In what sense? Ease of using it. Yeah. Ease of use. Enable him to perform the task which he is doing. Right. So it's ease of use, yeah. ability to perform the task. The other thing he focused on was the aesthetics. 
If you look at the iMac, the design, the outward, uh, the outside design of iMac was very attractive. Like people were saying, oh, what is this? I want to see it. He did not change much internally in the operating system. So if you read about iMac, there was not much change in the operating system or any part of the software. It was the external design, the aesthetic appeal. The ease of use was simple. It was appealing enough for the user to come and say, hey, what is this? Well, I, this is cool. They, he added colors, which was not there before. You would get a you know gray color computer. Now he added color to the external uh, part. So it was very simple ideas, actually, if you look at it. But he made a computer attractive enough for users to come take a look at iMac and see how it feels, how it uses. So best practices, some of the best practices, keep it simple, uh, keep it intuitive, and make sure it is easy to use. You may have the best idea, the greatest idea, you may have the best code, but if nobody is using it, nobody is willing to pay for it, then I think you have a challenge in your hand. So now you need to couple the best algorithm, the best idea with ease of use. If they come together, then I think you have a winner in it. So many times I've been asked this question is like, does this mean engineers become designers? Because we are all learning engineering, you know, all of a sudden we hear design. So like, do I give up engineering and become designer or what? So there are two different roles. There is this stream called design. Engineering needs to become aware of what design is. But there is now this discipline called design itself. And I think, I think some of the IITs have that. IIT Mumbai has a design program. IIT Gauhati has a design program. And then there are other institutes, National Institute of Design, and so on and so forth. Right? Uh, it's catching up in India. It has been existing for years in US. So there's nothing new. Uh, there's no rocket science here. But design in itself has become a discipline. And there are a couple of key roles. One is a, a researcher, a design researcher, a user researcher, and then user designer. And then within design, there, is like, there are many multiple uh, roles, uh, like communication design, visual design, interaction design, product design, industrial design. Uh, I think the design center in IIT Mumbai has many of these. Uh, they have product design, industrial design, many of these disciplines within design itself. So uh, it's a collaboration that needs to happen between design and engineering, marketing, sales, the business folks. So that's uh, what I wanted to cover. Uh, you know, the focus of user-centered design, uh, which is actually the reason I'm sharing this is I, from my experience, I feel that uh, it's applicable in almost every field. It's not just to software. Uh, you build a hardware product, it applies there. You build construction, it applies there. You build automobile, it applies there. Uh, so, and Microsoft in itself is learning. We we, uh, we don't claim to be the leaders in this space. The reason I shared the Apple story is, you know, some of you may be wondering that I'm talking more about Apple than Microsoft, coming from Microsoft. Actually, there is a book called Sketching User uh, Experiences, written by uh, Bill Buxton. Uh, he's a principal researcher at Microsoft. And if you read that book, he talks about that. And Microsoft has openly uh, acknowledged and appreciated Apple's focus on design. Uh, and so there's a lot to learn from Apple's experiences um, for not just Microsoft, for many uh, companies. And therefore, uh, uh, yeah. I feel that we are still learning, we're still trying to figure it out, we don't know it all, and it's an iterative uh, process that you go through. Uh, it takes a lot of effort, but if you can get it right, it can create wonders. So with that, I'd like to conclude unless if there are any questions, I'd be happy to. Do you have any answer. questions from anyone in the audience?
so the user centric design is something like we have to visualize what user can expect or what user is going to have before knowing their feedback right uh, it depends if you're trying trying to create something new like ipod yeah ipod was just a thought in steve jobs mind yeah right yeah how would you know whether it would work for the user because ipod doesn't exist right sony walkman exists and everyone is actually happy with sony walkman because if you look at the sales of same sony walkman it is stupendous right nobody is complaining about the bulky walkman and you have to adjust and all that so if it is something like ipod maybe you know you have to take the initiative to create those ideas or the storyboards or the interfaces but if it is something that is already existing like ipod is already existing now or iphone is already existing then how can i improve further on that that is where you can go and observe users the key thing is not just to ask the user hey are you happy with this a lot of times users don't know what they want yeah. most times actually they don't know what they want users are super busy with their life uh, a lot of times they are frustrated so the frustration is on something else they may take it out on your app and you may feel a little bit personal saying why is he saying like that so a lot of times consumers customers they don't know what they want so it's a combination of things of user research you have to do there is a qualitative research and a quantitative research you can send a survey out to 1000 people how many of us actually fill out the survey when we get right and even if you fill it out are we in the right frame of mind are we in the right mood right i know i like a lot of times i travel i get a feedback survey from jet airways where you know airlines and all and i skip it but if i had a bad experience i would probably make it a point to let them know but if i have a good experience i'll say you know forget it i have something else to do so it depends there is no formula to say you should always go to the user and find out it's a combination of things and uh, you have you must do a lo lot of spend a lot of time doing user research that will feed into design and then that will feed into engineering when the the user spectrum is large from 9 years to 90 years they, for example iphone or imac so in that case the designer have to visualize how 9 yeah. years old yeah. Yeah. yeah design i'll give you an example of have you uh, used kinect microsoft kinect anyone use kinect xbox xbox uh so kinect was so if you use kinect you know you're using body as a control right you don't have any device to play tennis or anything right so the bo using body as a control was nothing new nintendo and uh, i think sony already had that uh, before microsoft came out but it did not come from the xbox users that idea okay that did not come from a competitive analysis either it came from a brainstorming session that microsoft had internally okay and uh, the sketching right uh, and uh, 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 a group of two or three engineers they said hey can we use body as a control so the next version of the xbox uh, player let's get rid of these mouse and devices and can we use body as a control so they work for 9 months on the technical feasibility of using body as a control so it can be an idea coming internally it can be an idea from customer it can be an idea from not even a customer you just chatting with somebody on dinner and somebody suggested something and that stuck in your mind and you go back and you start drawing it out so there is no formula as such but what is important is you can come up with idea where the source or origination of idea doesn't matter whatever you design you need to take it back to the user your intended user to get early feedback and figure out are you on the failure path because if you're on the failure path you want to stop that you want to invest continuing investing in that path you want to change tracks
What was expected was not there in the movie. Yeah. So was there a user input there during the filmmaking? So could they have used that to get some early feedback from potential users saying, hey, what do you think about the script? What do you think about the story? What do you think about this? A lot of movies, you don't see a user input in the filmmaking process. It is a director's vision or the writer's vision. Many times it has been successful, but many times, despite the huge star cast, it has been a failure. Because you don't see, because it's just somebody's vision and they put it all together and it's a grand, big scope. But when they release it out, it's a huge failure. So, does that answer your question? Uh, any other importance of uh, user centric design and design driving the technology or the engineering part but if we look at it from the uh, on the technology part uh, we are having a user requirement a design requirement and we are designing a specific technology for that so aren't we limiting the scope of technology or engineering this way you may be there may be a lot of possibilities with engineering that you think you can do yeah it is possible. But at the end of the day, uh, like, how many features are there in Microsoft Word? So many. How many of you have actually used all the features? Not much, yeah. Not PowerPoint, yeah. Excel. Excel is an excellent tool. Yes. How much? Of those features do we use? Mm -hmm. We use the summation, <laughs> right? Uh, copy paste, right? So there's a lot of capability from engineering standpoint that is there in Word and Excel and PowerPoint. How many is it, how much of it is actually used by majority of the users? It's primarily copy paste, copy paste, copy paste that those features are there but nobody is using it no sir, limitations as in we are designing a technology specific to some particular user design so we are limiting the applicabilities of that particular technology and you probably want to do that because you want the user to use your application you have such great visual effects but if nobody is going to go and watch it then what's the use of all those special effects so you need to resonate with the audience, right? The movie has to resonate, it has to land well with the audience. If you lose your audience, yeah. you may have the greatest technical engineering capability, it's not of much use. So but all things are uh, sentiment driven. I think that this UI and all that, will, because if we talk about iPhone as well, uh, it's not only yeah. uh, the UI experience yeah. that is there, but their algorithms that they are running at the back. Means even a 256 MB of iPhone is performing much more than 2 GB RAM of any of the Android phones. It is sentiment. Because of their garbage collection algorithms and all that. So ultimately technology... It is sentimental. Yeah. Uh, the experience design is end-to-end -end experience. How do I feel about that experience? So if I take an airline, I am treated well, I am treated with respect, I get what I ordered for, even if it is at a higher price, I will go with that airline next time. But if another airline gives me cheaper price, but I am treated shabbily, I will always remember that experience, I will try to avoid that. I will say I am better off paying little more or maybe even much more but if I'm getting a good experience why because when I'm traveling I don't want to get stressed out I want to go to I'm more focused on my destination my job and coming back with a pleasant experience if I'm going on a personal family vacation I don't want my family to get stressed out because of some uh, you know so it is experience and sentiment driven and that's what Steve Jobs actually drove into the computer industry and software See you right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ramesh. Thank you. You can take the questions offline.